Hello. So this is on minimum capital requirements, the second video of topic eight. So a minimum capital requirement refers to capital for provisions, shareholders, equity and debt. So um, what do I mean by that? Provisions is where you expected losses on, um, on credit risky loans or um, bonds or anything like that, swaps, etc. You have a sort of expectation for a loss which you need to hold provisions against. Um, it's the unexpected loss that you have to have risk capital for. Um, and also the shareholders equity. So um, people who have bought your bank shares, that's shareholders equity. And um, we need to have enough capital to pay them off if the bank goes um, bankrupt. And also debt, particularly senior debt, um, will need to be provisioned in the minimum capital requirement, okay? So these requirements aim to reduce the risk of insolvency of, of going bankrupt by keeping a reserve of what we call regulatory capital. And that regulatory capital can't be locked into illiquid assets like very long-term loans or put into highly risky investments like um, Bitcoin options. <laughs> In particular, banks have been, um, US banks at least, are not allowed to trade in crypto um, currency, at least not their derivatives. Um, there are some exchanges where they can trade. <clears throat> so the minimum capital requirement, the MCR, um, is supposed to cover losses from not just market risk, but also credit and also operational risks. And as you may remember from topic two, there are two types of operational risks. One of them is fraud. That's the big one where you can lose a lot of money through fines. And the other is, um, or it could be, you know, a terrorist attack or something where you could lose a lot of money unless you're properly insured. Um, but then there are these little operational risks like, um, uh, it doesn't happen so much now because banks are moving towards blockchains and it's much more difficult to make small errors on a blockchain. But in the old days, when things weren't even on a computer, um, pe uh, people had to write tickets about the trades they did. And there was a huge potential for making um, what we call back office um, transaction errors. Um, so that's another form of operational risk. But that type of error, or loss due to small things like that, or, or you know, employees taking paper clips, uh, or you know, small things that are operational risks, but they're very frequent, but they don't have, they don't make a big loss. They're not very severe. These are in the provisions anyway. So um, each risk requirement is calculated separately um, per trading desk. Um, so it could be the loans desk, it could be the equity desk, it could be the credit default swap desk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they are aggregated. They're not added up, they're aggregated, taking account of correlations. Um, they're aggregated by risks and by desks. So on the trading desk, you might have separately market credit and um, on a trading desk, say credit default swap. You would have a credit spread risk, which is like a market risk requirement. You would have a credit risk, which is the default risk requirement. And you'd have an operational risk, which is the risk from somebody doing some um, fraudulent deals. Um, and so they can act, the, the desk can aggregate the risks to get a total um, market credit operational minimum capital requirement for that desk. Um, you could also just take all the market risks and add them up over all the desks and get a total market risk requirement for the bank and a total credit risk requirement for the bank and a total operational risk requirement for the bank. Or you could aggregate each trading desk risk. So you've got a total risk for the loans and total risk for 
um, international equity and a total risk for currency swaps or derivatives. So there are all these different desks who have total risk. And then you can add up the risks of the desks as well. So there's lots of different ways that you can aggregate the, um, the minimum capital requirements to get a total minimum capital requirement for the bank. So how do we calculate this MCR? Um, well, the 1996 amendment to Basel I introduced internal bar models to compute the market minimum capital. It was only for the market risk in 1996. And the rule for the minimum capital requirement for market risk is that it's going to be the maximum of two things. It's either a multiplier of today's value at risk or it's this value at risk star plus an add-on, ST. So VAR is the, in the VAR T without the star is just the 1% 10-day total VAR for the whole bank. So you can add up the bars from the trading desks and add up the bars um, to a total market risk requirement for the bank. And this is just taking the systematic VAR due to risk factors, because we can't do individual, there's too many different risk factors when you aggregate it. So it's just, we're not looking at the specific risks, just the systematic parts. And that's multiplied by M1, which is somewhere between three and four. And whether you have three, three and a half, four, depends on something called back testing. So that's where the Prudential Risk Authority in the UK will look at the results of the internal VAR models and say what your multiplier is going to be. Is it going to be three? Is it going to be 3.1, 3.2, 3.9, whatever, okay? And then the VAR star is the average of the 1% 10 day total VARs averaged over the last 60 days. And the reason why they, we, we do it that way is that um, if your um, current value at risk is quite low, but it wasn't very low a week ago or a month ago, we don't want to change your market risk requirement um, every day. So it goes up and down and up and down as much as value at risk does, because we know that value at risk depending on how you measure it. Um, but if you take um, the uh, exponentially weighted moving average model, it can change a lot. Even if you take what JP Morgan call the regulatory um, uh, VAR based on equal weighting over 250 days, it can still change quite a lot overnight. So in all, so that this um, amount of capital, which is, you, know, you can't change capital very, quickly, this introduction of a maximum of the two um, allows it to respond if it needs to go up. So suddenly you need to bring more in, but it won't allow it to go down just like that. Um, and then the ST is the specific risk requirement because that's not included in the value at risk models. And so there's an add on something like 12 and a half percent has to be added on for your specific risk requirement. It again, depends on the, what the particular regulators say. Now, the Basel II Accord recommended that this calculation be changed and there'll be another add-on, not just an add-on for the specific risk, but another add-on for stressed conditions. And they suggested that this stressed VAR should be introduced even when markets are very tranquil and volatility is very low and there doesn't seem to be much of a risk of some um, crisis coming around the corner. They recommended that that stressed VAR be added on anyway. Um, and this was I suppose in, in response to the banking crisis of 2008, 2009, where banks didn't have sufficient capital and a lot of them went bankrupt 
Bear Stearns, obviously Lehman Brothers and so forth, they all went insolvent. Um, and so banks had to increase the um, MCR a huge amount following that. So to calculate that stressed VAR, the VAR had to be calculated using an historical period of stress, such as the banking crisis, instead of using recent data. Um, and we'll go through what we call stress testing in section 8.4 and the various scenarios recommended by the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision. Anyway, so you calculate that stressed VAR and add it on to the minimum capital requirement um, using the formula on the previous slide, this one, you have to have another add-on here for the stressed VAR. And then in um, the Basel III changed that, in January 2016, the BCBS recommended that the market minimum capital, capital requirement in normal circumstances should be computed in a different way. Um, and so the only difference between this formula and the Basel I formula is that we now have two multipliers, M1 and M2. And M1 is no longer between three and four. It could be anything bigger than one. And M2 would be something between 1.5 and two. And again, those are agreed by the supervisor depending on the back test results. So the back testing refers to the models they use. Do they use historical VAR, Monte Carlo VAR, normal VAR? What are the risk factor mappings? Those are absolutely crucial. Um, how much data do they use? What are the systematic risk factors? All these things need to be assessed by the central bank and the central bank decides on the basis of those, what those multipliers M1 and M2 will be. So the value for M2 depends on the back tests. And in particular, with 10 or more what we call exceedances in the back tests of 1% daily VAR, you have to have M2 which is two, um, or you may not be allowed to use your value at risk model at all. And you might have to use standardized rules like the original standardized rules for credit risks. There are standardized rules instead of using internal VAR models that can be applied if your VAR model isn't good enough. Um, and this fundamental review of the trading book, FRTB, that I mentioned before, recommended um, that the market risk requirement change quite a bit. And in particular, from last year, 2019, instead of having 10, 1% 10-day 10 VAR in these VARs here, uh, it doesn't have to be 10. This H could vary. And in particular, if there's a sudden and severe impairment of liquidity in the market, then it could increase. So why would liquidity have anything to do with this H factor? Um, 10 days is basically how long we think it might take for a bank to hedge all the risks. If that banks can instantly hedge their risks in a day, then they only need to have a look at daily VAR because if the VAR gets too big, they can put on the hedge and everything will be fine. But if it takes a long time, which normally it will do, some things may take longer than 10 days to hedge. Um, for example, if, if a bank is holding some rather illiquid stocks and the only way to hedge those is perfectly, in other words, sell them, that's a perfect hedge, okay? Um, so if they, the only way that they can liquidate that risk is to sell them, but there's no buyers for those stocks, then you may need to have an H that's longer than 10. And 
Um, also, during stressful periods where market liquidity could really decrease, um, instead of using value at risk here in these calculations, you need to use something called expected shortfall, which is always bigger than value at risk. I hate the term expected shortfall, sorry. I always use expected tail loss. Expected shortfall sort of just, it, it, it sounds as though um, you're measuring the shortfall relative to some target amount, and it's not really anything to do with that. So unfortunately, it's a terminology that's become adopted. But in my books, market risk analysis books, I always use ETL, expected tail loss. So what is this thing um, that banks call expected shortfall? It's the expected loss, provided the loss exceeds the VAR. Now, the thing about VAR is that it tells us a level of loss which we hope will not be exceeded. For example, if the 5% one day VAR is $1 million, then we are 95% confident that we won't lose more than $1 million over the next day, provided the portfolio is not traded. There's no rebalancing in the portfolio. So we're 95% sure that we won't lose more than $1 million. But that means that there's a 5% chance that we will lose more than $1 million in our distribution, in our forecast. But um, it doesn't tell us if we do lose more than $5 million, could it be $6 million or could we lose $10 million? What would we expect to lose if we lose more than VAR? That is the expected shortfall, what we expect to lose if we lose more than VAR. So we can calculate it um, as a percentage of the portfolio value um, where H -A X H is um, an H day return, discounted to today, like everything in the value at risk model. So if we look at the expected H day return, and we're looking at the negative returns that exceed the VAR return. So if the VAR return is minus um, uh, 1% or something like that, um, not in dollar terms, but in percentage terms, then we'd be looking at all the losses, the returns that were greater than minus 1% in absolute value. So we just take the average of the losses which exceed the VAR, and that's very easy. If we use historical simulation or Monte Carlo VAR, we just look at the tail and average those losses in the historical distribution called the Monte Carlo VAR distribution. And if we use the normal linear VAR model, then there's a simple formula. Um, uh, here's the, it's like the VAR formula. We've got the sigma H and we've got the mu H, just like we have in VAR. But this first thing here is not capital Phi to the minus one, one minus alpha. It's something else. It's alpha one over alpha, alpha to the minus one times the normal density of phi to the minus one alpha. So for example, a portfolio is expected to return the risk-free rate. That means the mu h is zero because the discounted return discounted by the risk-free rate will be zero at least in expectation. <clears throat> the volatility is 12%. And assuming the returns are normal and IID, okay, so normal means we can use the normal VAR model. IID means we can use the square root of time rule. Find the 1% annual expected shortfall as a percentage of the portfolio value. Okay, so I don't need to use the, um, square root of time rule because I've got an annual standard deviation already, which is 12%. So my sigma H here, for H being uh, annual, um, is 12%. And you can see it down here in this calculation. 
the mu is zero, it's a 1% VAR, so alpha is 1%. So at the beginning, you can see 1% to the minus one. And then I have to do the normal density of phi to the minus one of 1%. Remember, for the 1% percent percentile, it's minus 2.33 approximately. But now I need to find the height of the normal bell-shaped curve at that point. Okay, it's the actual likelihood or the light of, or the height above that quantile. And it turns out to be 0 0.026652. I can calculate that in Excel. I'll show you that when we look at the Excel spreadsheet. So multiplying 100, which is 1%, uh, the reciprocal of 1%, times this quantity, this likelihood, times the volatility gives me 31.98%. So that's it for this video and I'll do the Excel spreadsheet.